Akotsu's freaking domain expansion finally gets revealed in chapter 249 of Jujutsu Kaisen. Along with that, we finally get clarity on the fate of Kenjaku, and it seems that we finally get the confirmation of what Yuji's new ability is that he gained in the time that he last saw Sukuna. This chapter just seemed way too damn short for me, but it was still action-packed. I mean, that's probably why it felt so short, because there was so much going on every single freaking page. So enough babbling, let's get right into it. So in the previous chapter, we left off with Rika and Akotsu coming face-to-face -face with Sukuna, as we were set to finally see the Queen of Curses versus the King of Curses. Well, before we get back to that, and we will get back to that, I promise, we actually take a step back to the moment that Akotsu first sliced off Kenjaku's head. And as many people theorized, as soon as Kenjaku's head was sliced off, that meant that Suguru Geto's body was technically dead. If you guys remember way back in the hidden inventory arc, Toji didn't want to kill Geto because he didn't know what would happen as soon as he would, like whether or not all the cursed spirits that he has stored up because of his technique would get unleashed, and pretty much run rampant like they are right now because that's exactly what happens all the cursed spirits that kenjaku had stored over the years just all burst out at once and akotsu calls for rika to take them out well in all the commotion this amalgamation of the cursed spirits kind of lifts kenjaku's head in a way as he adds a condition with one of the kogane this is when we actually see kenjaku summon the kogane to make a new condition to the Kulin game allowing sukuna to be the one to activate the merger with tengen so that explains the sudden glowing light that appeared in front of sukuna it's like that that was this womb version of Tengen that's being shown here, since as soon as Kenjaku makes the condition that Sukuna can begin the merger, that womb version of Tengen goes shooting off like Dragon Ball style, and it likely teleported in front of Sukuna in that small sphere form. So after seeing that Kenny still isn't dead yet, Akotsu straight up stabs Kenjaku in the head, which pretty much confirms his death right here because Kenjaku then goes on to say, he's happy that Takaba was his last fight because he had a lot of fun, but not enough fun to make up for a thousand years. And then he says now, it's your turn, so I'm not sure if he means Tengen or Sukuna or Okotsu here, but the important thing is that it seems that Kenjaku is giving his final words, and considering he's getting stabbed in the brain, which is the root of his curse technique, I find it very hard to believe that he's coming out of this alive through some kind of like gege shenanigans or something, because it definitely does seem like he's very much dead here, which honestly I'm pretty damn disappointed about, because there are so many unanswered questions, especially referring to the Heian era, that only Kenjaku could really answer, or you know, Kenjaku would be the very best person to answer these questions, I guess aside from Sukuna. And also, how the hell are we gonna get any explanation as to what happened with, you know, Kenjaku pretty much being Yuji's mom, him taking over Kaori's body and having her curse technique? Like, when the hell is that gonna come back into play, you know what I mean? There has to be some flashback that puts all of this stuff together that we're still trying to figure out. And honestly, I thought Kenjaku was gonna be the person to put those pieces together, but that seems not likely to happen now. So I'm really curious to see how we're gonna get all these holes of information filled out, or if we're gonna get them filled out at all, because Gege might just go Togashi style. I don't know, I wouldn't put it past Gege to just completely throw away that whole, you know, Kenny being Yuji's mom storyline. But whatever, fingers crossed that we finally get some answers on that end. But after we see this happen, we now cut to the present time, where Kotsu's analyzing the situation, and he notices that Sukuna's output of reverse curse technique is returning back to its normal speed, and it's only a matter of time for him to be able to open his domain expansion again. And on top of that, Higuruma is now dead. So I guess this is the confirmation of another person's death. <laughs> You can't keep getting away with it! Because it was left kind of vague as to whether Higuruma died or not. Again, once we get some other translations, maybe it was more so that he was defeated instead of killed. So there is that 5% chance that Higuruma is still alive. But nonetheless, Hirokotsu is in full regret that he wasn't here for that executioner sword plan. Because things would have likely gone differently. It would have likely worked. And he's trying to rationalize the fact that only he could have taken out Kenjaku, and having Rika there was necessary for the fallout of cursed spirits after Kenjaku had died. But at the same time, he thinks that Maki could have probably taken care of it herself. Well, we take a little break from his internal processing as he lunges his katana at Sukuna. And surprisingly, it seems like Sukuna had grabbed his blade, but in reality, he was using such tiny slashes around his hand, and Akotsu explains that he was essentially creating a chainsaw of slashes around his hand in order to grab the blade without actually physically touching it. So that's just yet another example of Sukuna being a straight up genius on the fly, but Akotsu doesn't relent here because he starts attacking him yet again, but this time Rika joins in so it's a 2v1 at the moment, and man just seeing these panels play out, all this action with no text, is just so surreal to see because for the longest time people have been talking about Akotsu versus Sukuna, the Queen of Curses versus the King of Curses, how would this fight go, and we're seeing it happen right here 
here. Well, as they're all trading blows, Akotsu gets back inside of his own head, and he realizes that all the rationalizing he's been doing is all pretty much just a bunch of excuses. And this is because he wanted to finish off Kenjaku himself with his own hands. And if we remember, this is like the personal grudge that Akotsu's been holding this entire time. It's been like his main motivation since he re-entered the story. He wants to take out Kenjaku so Gojo wouldn't have to take out his own best friend for a second time. Well, it seems that Akotsu's heavily regretting this choice because it seems that the situation has gotten really bad, and it likely wouldn't have gotten that bad if Akotsu stuck around. And honestly, I kind of have to agree with him because if Akotsu was there for that whole raid, the one where we just had four people, you know, Ino, Kusakabe, Higuruma, and Yuji jumping Sukuna at once, I have no doubt in my mind that that Executioner Sword plan would have worked. But hey, that's okay with me because getting pushed into a corner like this makes Akotsu immediately go into his freaking domain expansion. And finally, we get the official name and the appearance of the domain expansion. It's called Authenticity Mutual Love or True Mutual Love. We don't have an exact translation yet. And the domain itself seems to be this graveyard of swords with two tall stone crosses in the middle. To be honest, for my Fate fans out there, as soon as I saw this domain, I got instant flashes of unlimited blade works. Oh yeah. The bone of my sword. Like, this is almost the exact same concept. I really have to wonder if Gege is a Fate fan, specifically a Shiro Emiya fan from the series, because honestly, his abilities and Akotsu's abilities are kind of similar. Their characters themselves kind of overlap each other and, you know, their values and what happens to them, their backstories and stuff like that. But hey, that's a topic for a different video. The point is that we're finally getting Akotsu's domain expansion, and we get to see it in action right away, because Sukuna uses Hollow Wicker Basket to negate the sure hit of the domain, and at that moment, Akotsu who grabs one of the blades in the blade graveyard and whips it at Sukuna as he says Thin Icebreaker, which is of course a technique that he took from Urame. So here we are in the domain with Akotsu, Sukuna, and surprisingly Yuji, and as Sukuna takes some slight damage from the attack that Akotsu just threw at him, he immediately realizes the plan that they're going for here. You know, their next big plan after the Executioner Sword plan failed. Apparently, since Sukuna is still in Megumi's body, he has memories of Akotsu and his curse technique, which is copy. This, of course, allows him to copy curse techniques. So in Akotsu's domain, he's essentially able to use every one of the curse techniques that he's copied, likely each taking the form of one of the swords in the graveyard, and Akotsu can use them freely as he wants to. That even applies to the sure hit of the domain, because apparently he can pluck one of the curse techniques that he's copied and apply it to the sure hit as well. This is because as Sukun is assessing what their plan probably is, he points out that the sure hit of Akotsu's domain is likely Angel's curse technique, which of course is Jacob's Ladder. So knowing this, Sukuna deduces that Akotsu is forcing him to use Hollow Wicker Basket, which is pretty much taking one set of his arms and the mouth on his stomach out of commission, because he has to be constantly using Hollow Wicker Basket to not be hit by the sure hit. Because we all know as soon as he's hit by Angel's Curse Technique, his soul gets like vaporized or something and gets immediately pulled out of Megumi's body. So as his extra limbs are getting occupied, this is where Akotsu's gonna hit him with an endless barrage of stolen curse techniques. And the craziest part of this plan to me comes when he gets to Yuji. Sukuna reveals that each one of Yuji's punches essentially shreds up his soul which would allow him to eventually pull him out of Megumi's body. So that explains what happened a few chapters back when after Sukuna blocked a punch from Yuji, Sukuna got this weird feeling and he was even drawn with this super shaky aesthetic, kind of indicating that his very soul was touched or damaged or something. So that's probably how Sukuna figured this out so quickly because it took him a little bit to realize what had happened in that moment. Well this chapter ends with a banger of an editor's comment because it says the the new and old main character, the two will fight to defeat Sukuna. And man, that is just so awesome because yeah, Akotsu was technically the main character before Yuji was created to be the main character by Gege. And seeing them team up here finally is going to be so awesome to watch, especially within Akotsu's domain. I mean, I don't know how any of this is going to play out, but knowing Gege, you know, someone's going to die and it's going to be heartbreaking. So be ready for that, guys.